My name is Tanvi Patare and uh, I'm originally from Mumbai, India um, and I've been living in Florence for the past 11 years. Um, I'm a realistic painter, a figurative painter. Um, I studied at the Florence Academy of Art uh, for around um, three years and then I did the fourth year prize with them as well and I was fortunate to to get a teaching job at the school and so I've been uh, teaching there since I teach in the in their intermediate program in the second year with Daniela Stone uh, and I teach the third year um, as well with Ramiro Sanchez. I was very fortunate uh, my parents uh, when, since I was a kid sent me to these uh, little art lessons and uh, and so I was always uh, sort of curious about it interested in it and I could tell maybe I had like a little bit of a, of, of, of a hand for it. There's an art school in Mumbai called uh, Sir J.G. School of Art. Um, it's, it's sort of a really old art school. So it was set up by the British when they came to India around maybe 150 years ago. So it's a beautiful campus. It's huge, it's full of trees. And, um, it's sort of a world in itself, you know. Um, they have the commercial art department and the architecture, and I did the, I took the fine art. Um, so that was sort of the thing to do. I did my bachelor's in fine art uh, there, and uh, that was a four-year course. And it was nice because, in a way, it introduced me to a little bit of everything. But of course, because you're doing a little bit of everything, you don't get to do one thing really well. I was content. I, I thought I would uh, get a studio space in Mumbai and you know do exhibitions there and at whatever sort of level of technique I had then. And uh, but then I saw an exhibition by uh, a painter who came to Florence uh, in Mumbai. And uh, he was actually one of the first few Indian students who came to Florence Academy. And I saw his work and I was really impressed. And that was sort of the time when I was finishing my art school in Mumbai. And so I decided to um, ask him and he, he, he was very helpful. He should, told me about all these different art schools that are in Florence, like he mentioned Florence Academy, but she went to, but then there was also Angel and Charles Cecil. So he sort of introduced me to this world, which I wasn't aware of much before. Um, and it looked nice because they, it seemed like they took one specific subject, like realistic art, um, and then the old atelier style, and they really pushed the idea uh, further ahead and, and so I felt this was a nice sort of uh, continuation of where I, where I left off from Mumbai. It was sort of a deep dream come true. I think for, it's such a, in a strange way, it's such a cliche, you know, to live in, to be a painter in Florence. It's the same to be a painter in Paris, for example, to be in a paint, to be in a city where Leonardo, Michelangelo, all of these guys walked around. Uh, so, it, yeah, I got through and yeah, since then it's been a, a really fun journey because I think our roots are also important, but sort of the, this kind of path of faith that leads you uh, to a place where you are, which can be sometimes completely random, you know, um, and, and led me here. So who knows where we go from here. Even sort of in uh, art school, um, they, we used to have art history lessons and they, they explain everything from the Renaissance to sort of modern art movement of it Mondrian and, and so on forth. Um, and I always felt like a little bit like the school was divided in two groups of people. Uh, one that had a natural inclination towards uh, realistic art and one that had a natural inclination towards abstract art. And it, it felt a little bit like both could coexist you know, uh, both could learn from each other and, and, and we could coexist completely, totally normally. Um, but I, I do feel that I had more of a leaning towards uh, realism in general, right from the beginning, because we would have lessons where we would draw from the model as well back home. And because in India to draw from the nude was very sort of uh, still a little bit of a taboo. So we actually had 
a, a family of models that would come pose for us, um, like right from the grandmother to like the daughter. But the amount of lessons that we had with them was very little. It was good, but it wasn't enough. And, and I remember enjoying those lessons the most. Um, because it's, I, f I feel, I felt like it's something tangible. It's something that I can say, okay, it's right or wrong or strong or weak. It's something that I could sort of weigh a little bit, whether my work's working or not. Whereas with abstract art, it felt a little bit like, and I used to paint those as well. They were part of our lessons and it was enjoyable, but it was just, the spectrum was just very broad. And so you couldn't, you couldn't really gauge work in a way that was hard to do, at least in a school environment. Um, but what was nice about that, I have to say even back then, is it gave me the idea that your painting has to be, uh, there needs to be a certain subject matter. There needs to be a certain topic. Even if you're painting a person, there needs to be sort of like an underlying theme to your work, which was nice to know. So in a way, when I came here as well and I learned all the techniques, that's something that I, I do try to remember is that it is observation and it is a sort of a meditation from life, but um, there needs to be sort of a red thread as to what you're saying through it in a way. Um, it doesn't need to be an explicit, um, like a very, uh, illustrative uh, topic but it, it needs to have something more than just a pure observation of nature and my work re revolves around figurative art um, so i work with models a lot uh, and also uh, I, I work with nature so i do paint a lot of landscapes especially in this season um, and and to me it's it's just this infinite beauty you know like i'm i'm born a hindu uh, but if for me the idea of God, if there is a God, then for me it is the infinite power of nature, and and the way it manifests itself, it manifests itself in landscapes, it manifests itself in uh, in the smallest of uh, rows, it manifests itself in the most beautiful human beings. So I think every day is sort of like a, a, a worship to to that, an homage to, to that. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it, to me, that, that inspires me. The beauty in nature, to, to me, that itself, and, and it changes. The more you travel, the more you see, uh, your library increases. So there's never sort of a dull moment uh, to say, mm, I don't know what to paint from. It, it, it's just, you know, like you look around yourself, you take your easel down the, the road uh, and there's a, there's, or you meet someone down the road, you, you ask them to pose for you. Uh, I think I'm a sort of like a, a little bit of a journalist, you know, trying to capture these little uh, moments of life that I think are beautiful. So, um, yeah. People also teach you, you know, how we naturally tend to have prejudices. I think it's very rare that, that we don't have any based on where you grow up, where you come from, what your sort of natural DNA gives you. And, and I think when you paint different types of people uh, or where they come from as well, I, I think it opens up your library of, of how people can be. Um, and in turn, it sort of enriches me as a person as well. Uh, hopefully makes me a, a bit broader in my perception of life. Um, see, so that is, that is my inspiration. I, I do love sort of technically, I do love uh, Art Nouveau a lot. Um, I love Mooka, Klimt. Um, I love the the indulgence that they bring into into their work, um, the love their love of nature and how they interpret it with their design. Um, I I sort of want to go hopefully in that direction where I work from life and I take everything like that I study from life, but I sort of merge it with this sort of otherworldly design world uh, a little bit sort of and a step in between sort of a dream world, a design world and the realism sort of meaning together. That's sort of the, 
at least now I feel that is the most exciting uh, part about yeah painting most of my sort of more let's say for lack of a better word more serious uh, projects in the studio they begin usually from an uh, either they begin from an idea so sort of a word you know? um, a word a concept that is either inspires me because it's beautiful or it's a word that is um, uh, confusing to me in my life um, and and it's something that my mind can't wrap itself around and then slowly over a period of time I try to come up with an image that will best display this word sometimes it's actually a flash of an of an idea like an image and then I will try to do a little color study um, like a little color sketch of it and uh, try to evolve it there from my imagination from my memory um, and then I will hire a model to sort of specifically fit that painting that 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 color sketch um, and 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 it's the same process for the word as well let's say if I get the word I will it won't be necessarily that I, I've I've, I've thought about it and tomorrow I will work on it. I, I will let it sit at the back of my mind for a while. Um, and as you go along life, I think it, um, it, you will see images that will suddenly feel like they click well with it. Um, see, the, there's a few paintings that I've worked on, like Synchronicity, for example. It's about two people who connect really well. Uh, almost as if they are two halves of a co coin. Like me and Dan Daniela, it's a strange relationship we have. We are, uh, she's my mentor and now she's my boss, but she's also my friend and a sister. And sometimes she role, assumes the role of a mother. So I wanted to sort of portray that relationship. And I had two models sort of juxtaposed next to each other in an oval composition. So, Sometimes it's words. So essentially the process boils down to, it comes from a word or from memory or a flash. And I usually do a little study, uh, a color study, then I will hire the model. The nice part and the tricky part of sort of the place where I'm in now with my work is that I have a lot of, I feel that I have a lot of freedom uh, to compose, to so sort of like uh, have landscapes behind the model that are from my imagination. So there's no sort of, uh, I'm not painting the model in that corner in my studio, you know. Um, but it also comes with the, the added pressure that because I'm trained to paint from life and copy life to my best possible ability, uh, it becomes hard to not blindly chase life. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it, I, have to, I have to make decisions sometimes that are good for the painting on its own. And they might be different than what the, what the model's offering me, for example. So it's interesting and exciting. And you sort of take reality to as much as you can and then you try to modify it into something a little bit more elegant, a little bit more beautiful, a little bit more thoughtful. And sometimes, you know, uh, nature can be stiff as well. Um, or um, that day, that person must be feeling sad. And that's not the mood that the painting wants to have. Or they're very excited and very exuberant. And that's not the mood that the painting essentially is based on. And so you, I think when you study from life a lot, it's almost as if you want to prove to your viewer that you can paint really well, right? And, and that's sort of the mentality that comes from your education. You're, prove, you're trying to prove really hard to yourself and the audience that you are a good painter. The challenge is to do that and then take it further, more than that, like beyond that. You know, some painter like Rembrandt or if you even see some of today's contemporary like Arden Erdrum, I mean, they take, I think, they, they have a unique way of taking what's in front of them um, and sometimes very good in a very grotesque manner but it even make it more beautiful you know i think if you are curious 
even just curious and, and, and passionate about, about art, um, I think you should definitely uh, try to hone on that. I think life, you know, all of us get this one opportunity at life. I don't, I don't know if there's a life after this, you know, a human life at least. And so I feel that if you have this curiosity, then you have to indulge in it. You have to uh, feed it. And most times, one of the harder parts is probably going to be the practice part of it. Even if you're really, if you're really passionate about it, and if you have the, if you have the inclination for it, the you still have to put in the hours. Everyone has to put in the hours. So it's not going to drop from somewhere. So you. So practice is really important, which means that you have to maybe sign up for some sort of uh, education. Uh, workshops are a great way to introduce yourself to, um, to different ways of learning. Uh, but a, a, a school where you can actually go and take regular lessons as well is helpful. Because I've had two different types of educations and I've listened to a lot of podcasts where um, people are more self-taught as well. And uh, the advantage of that is of course you have a unique language that you came up with. But sometimes I think it's harder to arrive at that goal with a with, with good amount of time. You know, it just takes a long time. So schools sometimes I think even if they give you a certain amount of technique that feels maybe overall similar, is still a better way to arrive to the point, that point, quicker. All of us have our own uh, way, path, unique paths to, to do it. Search, search for that. Search for your way of telling a story.